podcast. I'm here with Samneet Chapal. Samneet, how are you? I'm doing well, Greg. How about yourself? Doing great, doing great. So Samneet, I've known you since pretty much day one of the Genesis Volatility Saga about three years ago. I always refer to you as our favorite quant. So I would love <laughs> to maybe get a little bit about your background. Maybe you could educate the, the listeners to how you got to where you are today. For sure, and thank, thanks for having me on in the first place. So I would say that I always had a really strong interest for markets from a young age. I, I would wake up and listen to the news, CNBC, when I was in high school and continue that sort of over in university as well. And that sort of naturally led me to want to go to work for the biggest and fanciest investment banks uh, back in uni. But, uh, you know, fortunately, none of that actually panned out. And um, I actually ended up starting my career in uh, accounting, in auditing at one of these big four firms. Mm. And I, I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. It was, in fact, it was sort of the opposite. And I sort of got inspired by talking to a lot of people on Wall Street on like, what actions should I take to break into this space? And it was this one particular conversation I had with this like senior PM at um, one of these big Canadian banks and he was just about to retire. And he told me that he's spending his evenings and his weekends. Mind you, this guy was like in his 60s back then. He was spending his times learning how to program in Python, learning how to code, because he saw the shift of how markets are moving more towards uh, being you know, algorithmic and quantified and so forth. And that really sort of shifted my perspective on how I wanted to sort of break into the space. So. As a result of you know talking to a lot of other people who sort of said the same thing, I was naturally like led more towards learning programming, learning the data science on on the side, and really just studying this very diligently while still working my full time job. And then after I passed my you know CPA exam, I had the choice of either continuing to work there or sort of take the plunge and study full time of data science and machine learning. Uh, fortunately, I took the path of studying further, and that led me to go back to school, get my master's in data science. And at the time, I was diving quite deep into the crypto option space, which naturally led us to be introduced as well, as well as the facts, the, the folks at Ledger Prime. Wow, that's, that's really fascinating. So there's a couple things I want to touch on here. One sure. is, uh, you know, trading is notorious to be known as like a soft skill set. So experience counts for a lot. You had that experience kind of just following from high school and, and keeping an eye on the markets and getting accustomed to what things are doing. But then there's sort of this new element, which is the hard skill set, which you learn from you know practicing coding and, and learning Python and stuff like that. How long would you say that it took, like how many years of Python did you need to know before being useful at all in Python, would you say? I would say it really depends. It, you don't necessarily need a ton of knowledge in Python to do stuff that's useful in finance per se. I, I think it really, like if you're building a full on automated algorithmic trading system, um, you know, clearly you will need several years of experience, but if you're doing just exploratory data analysis or relatively light back tests, you can probably get away with, you know, just a few weeks worth of Python. Uh, for myself, at least, I needed about a year and a half of part-time Python, and then the masters really just drilled it down, uh, of the, like the core knowledge of like the different ways to be a little bit fancier with it. But I, I would say there's no like set answer to it. Uh, the way I like to think about it is flip the question on its head, of, like what do you want to get done first, and then you can sort of like chip away at that that way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, um, and that's pretty interesting. So, you know, back testing—that's a nice hard skill that you know I I don't do back tests myself. So, you know, you provided some nice back tests for the report we recently launched. Um, you know, what can you just walk us through, like a typical structure of, of doing a back test, like maybe from start to finish? Like, how do you how do you brainstorm the idea and collect the data, and then kind of some of the basic rules of a basic back test? Yeah. So. I primarily focus around the crypto option space for a lot of the back testing. And I think the first thing to do is to first have an idea that 
you sort of see in traditional markets where you see uh, that exhibits itself in the crypto option space, like a phenomenon that we might see. Um, or speaking to my, my colleagues, uh, they might have ideas from what they see when they're market making and so forth. So I think having an idea, first of all, is, is number one, because that helps you reduce sort of that data mining bias of like just trying to fit the data to find a backtest that fits your, like if it fits the data itself. Um, so I'd say that's number one. And then number two is having like a good sort of pipeline. Um, we're fortunate that we have a lot of like tick level data as well as like hourly, minutely data around the crypto option space. So having that sort of organized and easy to collect matter uh, makes it a lot faster for us to build back tests accordingly. And then I would say that like the last step is just building the inherent logic of it, uh, double, triple checking it just to make sure because there's a lot of times in the past where these small little uh, bugs get unnoticed until you go through and like really review it uh, carefully. So I think getting the logic down right and then building it in pieces as opposed to attempting to build the entire backtest all at once um, was really what helped me uh, be a lot more diligent in catching mistakes. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then kind of, you know, talking about crypto vol versus maybe traditional assets and traditional asset vol, you know, what kind of got you interested in the crypto side of things as opposed to just going to equity vol desk or, or commodity vol desk? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'd say that so back in university, I was uh, really like, you know, a fanboy of a lot of these like old school macro guys. And I know, I think Mike Novogratz was still at Fortress at the time. And then he recently like pivoted to go like full time into Bitcoin. And then I also heard of this guy called Dan Moorhead and Pet, who recently left his job to start Pantera. And I saw these guys were like, you know, macro legends and moving into the crypto space. So that's what sort of kept me interested in the space in the 2017 run up. Uh, it's sort of hard to forget once, you know, prices go up that fast. Um, so that's where the crypto interest lied. And then I think the vol, vol, um, vol trading interest lied just from general um, derivatives interest. After studying through CFA, that was like the number one topic that, you know, captivated my interest the most. So knowing that there was a crypto options market itself uh, was really, you know, it, it was a win-win from that regard. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, just to point this out, I just realized it for the first time. So you're a CFA and CPA combo, is that right? <laughs> so I, I've been fortunate to pass the CFA and I have that designation, but I actually dropped out of the CPA program to go full time and like just learn the data science and go into crypto. So. I can say that I passed the CPA, but I, I'm technically not fully qualified. Cool, cool. So talking yeah. about crypto ball, what are some of the things that you like to look at normally on the surface? You know, is it term structure, is it wings? Like, well, what's kind of a captivating area of interest for you? I would say that at the monies usually tell you the most, like the at the monies have the most liquidity and the most generally the most trading around them. So it's a good indication of like what, what's going on, but there are occasions where just over this past, over these past few weeks, we've seen a lot of interest in like wing buying. And that's something that really interests me. Um, I think it was like the Fed 28K calls. Mm -hmm. There was this huge buyer right before this massive move up from like 20 to 23K. Um, whenever I see stuff like that, I find it pretty interesting because in some cases, like these guys tend to be pretty spot on in terms of timing. So I like to look for those like wingy trades uh, when they're done in a lot of size. Because generally, they're not necessarily um, like hedging their book per se. If, they're, if you're buying like a five delta call, like it's generally like a directional play as opposed mm -hmm. to a vol trade itself. Oh, that's interesting. That's like an interesting tell that, you know, maybe someone's just like punting out there based on those, those way out of the money calls and seeing what happens. I remember back in 2021, we saw, or 2020 going into 2021, we saw Bitcoin, I think it was just breaking above 20,000 for the first time and there's a 36K call buyer. Right. Yeah. And those all yeah. ended up being very good and in the money and all that stuff. So that was a pretty right. smart play for size too. Um, yeah. 
so some of the things in our report that we noticed is, you know, we the ball shape or the ball surface shape is still yet to be figured out. So the way that I like to say it is, you know, before 1987 crash, uh, equity skew used to have flat uh, put balls, meaning at the money and out of the money puts were, you know, about the same balls. And then after that crash, the market woke up. And I'm wondering if it's the same thing in crypto where we're still trying to figure out the shape. We saw 2022 have this, you know, negative spot ball correlation. 2021 had this positive spot ball correlation. Um, is there any trends or anything that kind of stick out to you as far as, you know, vol, vol stuff goes? I would say that it, it, there's, there's different regimes, like you mentioned. I, I don't think it's like set in stone of like puts always being bid or calls being bid. Um, you know, clearly from like the report we've we saw that being long puts and selling calls over a long enough period of time does appear to outperform the the reverse of that so i i would say that like it, it's very regime dependent and right now you know just over the past few days we've seen how fast SKU is repriced itself uh, whereas like, at least for btc like calls are being bid over puts um, personally, I think this is like a temporary phenomenon. I don't really see this being a, um, you know, a long lasting change in the nature of the market, at least for the risk reversals. But, um, to answer your question, I think it's very regime dependent and, um, there's no real universal, uh, way to say that, you know, one is bid over the other, at least from calls or puts. Yeah, totally. And then you mentioned earlier that, you know, you, you're, Technically, you still at Ledger Prime. So Ledger Prime was a big market maker in the space. Is there anything in particular that is different from a market maker's perspective as opposed to a taker's perspective? Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you when you're doing analysis or anything like that? I would say the biggest um, the biggest difference is like sort of with being market making, you're forced to take on a lot of client flow, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether it's not necessarily um, what a position you want to take on, you sort of have to take it on, obviously within certain limits and, you know, reasonability. Um, so to that extent, a lot of the research and a lot of the analysis for market making at least is on like, what, what price did you execute on relative to like BPO and so forth. Whereas with taking, yeah, which I focus a lot more on like sort of the discretionary strats that are um, not necessarily market making, I would say those are more so looking at phenomena in the market, like looking at the risk reversal premium mm -hmm. or the variance premium and sort of thinking about ways to encompass those in a trading strategy. Um, if we notice that there is a certain edge or a certain, um, a certain strategy we want to execute, in theory, we could sort of tilt our market making um, system to be a little bit more favorable to those options so we can leg into them but um generally th that's sort of the distinction between the two yeah that's interesting and then what about like DeFi options so obviously that's kind of that's a brand new paradigm so to speak and we're seeing right. DeFi options kind of take hold more and more is that an area that you focused on at all yeah i, I would say that we were pretty pretty large market makers for a lot of these like auctions on a weekly basis. Personally, I think that in order for these DeFi options to scale in the future, they will need to continue to rely on the support of, of professional market making liquidity on the back end. Um, I'm a bit skeptical on the whole AMM approach. Mm -hmm. I've yet to sort of see a model that, uh, you know, makes sense in, in, in the broader context, but, um, you know, for, for the time being, I think these DeFi options are still checking along despite sort of the market volatility and so forth. Yeah, that's interesting. Real quick on the AMM, I'm a big Lyra fan. I think there's something there. <laughs> so we'll have to talk through that maybe off camera. But I just love <laughs> to sure. chat about that. Um, yeah. And then, so kind of over your career, is there, you know, maybe any lessons that you learned or like things you would go back and change or you know, oh, I wish I studied this instead of that, or I wish I learned this language instead of that language. Like, what kind of advice would you give someone who, you know, maybe is a young professional who wants to become a quant like you? 
I would say like, you know, aside from learning the programming side of things, I think that's like pretty, like that's very well understood by everyone that you need to know how to program, you need to know the technical knowledge. But I would say the one big game changer that personally I'm working on right now myself is diving more into like the inner game of like the mental side of trading, mm. of understanding your emotions, of like, you know, why do you make certain trades? Of sort of deconstructing your subconscious beliefs around, you know, your trading process. I find that that in itself has a lot of use to it, and you can sort of break down um, like destructive patterns or destructive habits that you know cause you to make mistakes, or you, or you can find out patterns that really help you accelerate. So I'd say that's sort of like the the biggest piece of advice I could give anyone. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, our co-author, Ewan Sinclair, uh, <laughs> hates inner game stuff. But unlike you, I love that stuff. It's so fascinating to yeah. me. Uh, have you ever read Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas? Yeah, yeah, one of my favorite books. Me too. I'm actually just rereading it. It's interesting. For anyone who hasn't read it, it's really about the psychology of trading and really your, your inner psychology and how you reflect, you know, or the market reflects back to you what you're, what you're projecting into it. Um, it's very interesting to read that at the beginning of your career, middle yeah. of your career, end of your career. Uh, it's like I'm rereading it for the first time. Is there any books that you know were very uh, influential to you? I would say you and Sinclair's books are gold standard, pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, not not just showing his books because he's a co-author, <laughs> but I remember even when I was like learning the basics, I would basically go through every plot or every diagram in his book and I would take their bit options data and see if I could replicate um, the stuff he's doing like traditional markets with the stuff he's talking about in his book. I think um, the volatility trading book is probably the best, um, you know, best literature out there for um, like relatively advanced or intermediate ball traders. So I would say his, his material is like top notch. I'm right there with you. I think that's my number one book. I actually have it like posted on my wall and it's not because he's a co-author. It's, it's more surreal, surreal, if anything, that, you know, he's part of our team. Um, but I really appreciated his books a lot. Um, so, you know, kind of outside of, outside of work, obviously you live on the West coast of Canada. We could, I'm also Canadian, but we could tell when you said progress instead of progress. Um, <laughs> it's a nice Canadian tell in the accent. Um, so what do you like to do outside of work is do you go skiing or do you have any like hobbies or anything like that? Yeah, so I mean like you mentioned we're on I'm on the west coast of Canada So got to make the most out of the slopes. So pretty big snowboarder uh, Also do a lot of running as well. There's a lot of gorgeous trails here in in Vancouver So spend a lot of time aside from you know what I can get off of from being on crypto Twitter and like looking at the markets and so forth that is awesome. And then kind of, uh, again, real quick, if there's like newer traders or anything like that, you know, is there any kind of like last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with them? Um, I would say that, you know, have goals, you know, have, have, have a goal of, you know, where you want to be similar to our, it's how I had a goal of, I wanted to be a quant. I wanted to work alongside like world-class people in the crypto option space and just, you know, constantly focus on that. Um, and then also, you know, focus a lot on the inner game. I think that has a huge bearing on one success. And then do you have any opinions on, you know, where crypto options market is going to go from here? Do you still, you know, expect growth in crypto options market? And, and if so, is that going to be just dare but continuing to grow? Or is it going to be, you know, CME options? Like, well, where do you think things happen next? So personally, I think in order for this space to further grow, we're going to probably need to see some form of like stable coin or like dollar collateralized options for institutional players to come in. Because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure a lot of these like trad five folks don't really want to hold BTC as collateral when, when trading options. We sort of saw that shift in the perp space. So I think we'll start seeing that in um, the option space as well. Um, other than that, I mean, we've, we've heard of people, we've heard of like institutions saying that they're going to enter the crypto option space from a market making perspective, but we've yet to see that happen. 
I think we will see a lot of it more when um, the CME options gain a bit more liquidity or there's more interest from um, the, in, the, their clients themselves. But um, other than that, I would say like BTC and ETH are probably the main focus for the time being. I don't really see any other alts for at least the option space on the liquid side taking off uh, in, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting about sort of the, the inverse options where it's Bitcoin collateralized and Bitcoin yeah. settled. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of clients ask me, you know, why did Deribit do it like that? Um, and one thing I like to remind them is when Deribit first started trading options, it was 2016. And we didn't have like an ERC-20 st token standard or, or uh, stable coins like we do now. So that was pretty much the only way to do it. And now that we have that, now, now we have the capability of going to, towards a more traditional model. Like you said, do dollar settled, dollar collateralized. And it, and it kind of fixes a lot of potential convexity problems, especially on the, on the put side. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And so, okay, cool. And then real quick, kind of just last, last thing here. Um, so, okay, so you said that uh, you don't see many like altcoins, you know, besides, you know, BTC and Ether are gonna be the main vol markets. What do you make of sort of the Solana thing? So, you know, was it surprising to you that Deribit dropped Solana support for options? Uh, and, and what do you make of that? I mean, I don't really see it being too much of a surprise because even when Solana was trading on Deribit, the spreads in themselves were quite wide. Mm -hmm. And I think it was mostly a function of institutional and retail interest. I, I don't think they would have taken it down if it was a popular product. Mm -hmm. So I think it goes to speak to the actual popularity of the product in the first place. Um, and, we, and again, we saw that just on screens of seeing how wide the bid asks uh, spreads were as well as like the lack of volumes on there. So but perhaps like in the future, once we see the next bull market or once we see new institutional folks, maybe they will, there will be a renewed interest, but at least in the past, we didn't, we didn't really see it. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's what I noticed too. The volume and the spreads were always kind of wide in Solana options. I was, I was kind of unpleasantly surprised to see that there's so little participation in that market. Uh, I thought, yeah. I thought Solana was going to be a lot more popular before the whole FTX thing. Well, Sam Neat, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for all your contributions on this amazing report and the back-tested uh, results that we get to share with everyone. I think that's very fascinating. Um, and so we'll talk to you next time. And everyone who tuned in, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Sure. Thanks for having me.